part of, part of the same report. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Good evening and welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sue Crane. It is May 22nd, and we are delighted you are here. Thank you for coming. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a few announcements, one of which is this is going to be a Memorial Day weekend. And so throughout this county and country, we will be celebrating Memorial Day uh, remembrances of people who have given and given and given. And in Red Hook, it will take place at the Memorial Park. Um, Tivoli also has a ceremony. What time is Tivoli's? Do you know? Is it 9.30ish or so? 9.30 or 10 o'clock at Memorial Park in Tivoli. And Red Hook kicks off at the Red Hook High School with a parade that um, assembles there and, and goes through town up to the Memorial Park in the usual route where we are inspired with local speakers and thoughts about all of those sacrifices made. So I hope everyone will come and enjoy that. The, um, the talent in the student bands is always inspiring, and um, we hope for good weather. Does the parade start at 10? The, um, the parade, I believe, kicks off at 10, and the ceremony is usually almost exactly an hour later. Yeah, but they like to have people there a little early, maybe quarter of 10 if you're marching in the parade. A um, couple of quick things. I have um, a number of really quick announcements, one of which is that at the Jack Lewis Gymnasium at Red Hook High School on May 25th from 10 to 11, Mark Kelly will be having a student interview and the public is invited to attend. It, Mark Kelly, as you may know, is the husband of Okay. Senator, uh, yeah, yeah, former yeah, Senator yeah, Gabby, yeah. She was Gabby, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Gabby uh, Gifford. Gabrielle Gifford, <clears throat> right, and he will be there. She is, sure. I guess, she and he are this the... invitation only. Yeah, okay, well, I think that they won't turn people away. Yeah. I think they're going to be very happy mm -hmm. to have people there. She is the uh, commencement speaker at Bard College that same day. Um, You will all know, I'm sure, by the time you hear and see this, that the Red Hook School Board has presented and the public has accepted the budget for 2014, and we congratulate them on that and are happy for Johanna Moore and for Kelly Mosier, who will be the, the uh, board representatives. I want to remind everybody that the Office of Aging Senior Picnic is scheduled for um, Wednesday the 26th at noon and it will occur in Tivoli Park, the Tivoli Memorial Park. It is for the residents of Red Hook, Rhinebeck and Milan and it's always a great event and we're looking forward to that. That's again Wednesday the 26th at noon. I was just looking to see um, of June of June, sorry, and uh, I believe they like to hear if you're intending to come. You can call Office for Aging, um, and that is 486-2571. I'm sure they wouldn't turn anyone away. Every, they love having everyone show up. Um, there is a 2013 Household Hazardous Material Disposal and Electronics Recycling event at, on June 1st at the Town of Rhinebeck Highway Department. So if you have um, hazardous waste, fluorescent light bulbs and so forth, small electronics to dispose of, that is when it will occur in the town of Rhine, at the Town of Rhinebeck Highway Department June 1st. And I wanted to congratulate, because I wasn't here last week, the two gals who, who won the um, VFW DEC camp, the, two Crane girls, and I believe Helena O'Shea, 
was was also involved. I have this yeah. announcement. Just one, mm -hmm. yes. one, crane. one crane. Oh, I saw a picture in a paper today. Why Hanlon. was Hanlon. Hanlon? Yeah, Hanlon. But I saw um, Hanlon and Helena, both of them. Both of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Helena is O'Shea, not, okay, I thought that was, okay, so it's Helena O'Shea and Hanlon Crane, and they're going off, thanks to the VFW of Red Hook, post 7766, to EDC camp. I'll be playing with polywogs and <laughs> all kinds of turtles and all kinds of stuff and come back informed for all of us. I hope they, they were invited to come here and talk about their experience and if they weren't we'll oh, I think we forgot. We'll get a note out to them to that. make sure they do. Because that's always fun to hear hear what happened. Um, there will be a food drive on Tuesday, June eleventh, and it's entitled Give a Child a Summer Meal. It's a food drive for the benefit of Duchess County Community Action. And it will be uh, organized at Red Hook Firehouse 1 to 3, sponsored by the Red Hook Seniors and the Town of Red Hook Senior Services Committee. And food donations can be dropped off from 1 to 3 on that day or 6 to 8 p.m. It's a wonderful um, effort on the part of children in our community. Again, that's Tuesday, June 11th, um, for children a food drive. I wanted to say we've talked in the past and there's probably not exactly anywhere else I can put this so I, I'm going to do it up front. We had talked to some for some ex months ago about the possibility of developing a relationship with the Rhinebeck, the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome for the, the reuse of our old highway garage which they were very interested in. Um, dissembling and reassembling at the aerodrome. And they had representatives come here, look at it, and talk with us. And they have since had, I think, a board meeting or two, and I talked with them this week. They are not able to undertake that project of, of um, dissembling at least part of the old highway garage for their use as much as they would have loved it because, and how appropriate it would have been there on that site. But they don't have enough volunteers to do all the work that they have to undertake to begin the season and they can't undertake this additional project this year and, and send their regrets but thank us for the opportunity. So we're going to be looking further at um, going out for requests for proposals from persons who maybe wish, maybe interested in um, dissembling and using, reusing the metal in that building. And that, that's just a information of more to come. And I think I have one other thing, and it, this comes by every so often, and it is... Um, an it, it's a notification, actually, from Montreal, at, and it's a New York State DOT recognition that special events and races must notify communities that are involved. And apparently there is, yet again this year, another race that will involve part of Red Hook. And they're just letting us know that um, this will come through our community. It's from Montreal to New York City, I think, is how it goes. And um, the very idea is pretty much overwhelming to me. But in any event, they want us to know that it's for the consideration of public safety and potential disruptions to traffic and commerce, it is important that our local government is a partner in this event. And if you are interested in any portion of the event, you can call David Wooden at dot.newyork.gov. And if you have any objections, he's definitely a person to talk to. Last year, it went through, I think, touched in Red Hook, and we had no complaints or concerns. Is this a is this a no, I think it's a. I think it's a. Running race. I think it's a running race. Yeah. Oh. It's, yeah. Obviously, really. 
Well, you, yeah, it's hard to tell from this notice. It's hard to tell from this notice. I think they stop and rest and go on. I don't know how it works. It, it, this doesn't really, it talks about a road race. I don't know. County, state highways and multi county speed contests and races. Must be it must be on vehicle. Must be must be bicycle. But it doesn't specify. More to come. I will tell you more about it next time. <laughs> I'm unprepared to tell you just exactly what's racing through our town and village. But something's coming. <laughs> something's coming. Get ready. <laughs> It's called, um, the notification is from um, New York State DOT, and it's called Application for PERM. The event name is DEFI, -E Montreal, New York. DEFI, Mont Montreal, New York. And just how they do their thing, I'm not sure. Very mysterious. I thought it was bicycle, but I could be wrong. But I'll tell you next time. They're asking for us to protest if we want to otherwise sit down. Um, okay. So, I think that's it for me. Um, Harry, do you have any announcements? No, not tonight. Okay. Bill? No. Uh, Brenda? Mm, no more, thanks. Sue, can we count on you for one? Nope. Nothing can be. Thank you. Oh, you did it all in my absence. <laughs> Good. Well, never know. I'd like to open a public comment period if there is need for one. It is uh, a little after 20 of 8. Does anyone have public comment? Yes. Sue, uh, just uh, a note uh, on, uh, uh, for the path of history, the New York State Festival, <coughs> following history through the State on the weekends of June second. Chris, and, Chris, how about you stand up? Oh, I'm sorry. And and June then we 2nd. can be sure you're heard on the panel. <coughs> June second and June ninth at the Elmendorf, we'll be having a uh, pop-up display on Red Hook goes to the Civil War at the front and at home, and I think it'll be very interesting. And if I uh, just wanted to put that on the record, so that it's just a, it's going to no another display of how much we have been involved in serving this. Uh, extraordinary country of ours. Thank you. When so is that? What time, Chris? Be, the Elmendorf will be open from 1 until 4 p.m. on Sundays, the 2nd and the 9th okay. of June. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll have uh, displays uh, of uh, people who served at the front. And that's very interesting. That's great. Thank you, Chris. And that's their wonderful. photographs, too. And that's sponsored by the. the Egbert Benson Historical Society and the Friends of Elmendorf. <laughs> yes, and could you just give us an update on that? That's an announcement to be made. Did that did to, that vote? Thank you very much. Did uh, that vote happen? The vote happened. It happened yes. on the nineteenth and uh, last night. It happened on the nineteenth. The uh, Egbert Benson Historical Society members voted to uh, accept the consolidation with the Friends of Elmendorf, and last night the Friends of Elmendorf, many assembled. Uh, agreed and accepted consolidation with the Egbert Benson Historical Society. So both organizations are looking forward to working together in a renewed, renewed uh, capacity for the future is historic Red Hook, which we will celebrate our heritage and uh, have a, a uh, just a new beginning. But it all stems from our wonderful bicentennial celebration and the goodwill that came out of that and the extraordinary amount of effort that went into that. And as we see here. Uh, it's a story that will continue, and we are very pleased about that. Thank Stay you. tuned. Well, you should be, and you, you and Claudine, and no, and certainly we only, Loretta, and everyone else who was involved. Thank you. We were only walking in the footsteps of the giants who came before us, Rosemary yeah. Coons, and uh, Bob and Barbara Bielenberg, and uh, John and Aralosi, and you, and all the boards, and everybody who's ever volunteered for this town. So, Chris, the new name of the organization will be what? Will be, tentatively speaking, but I, I think it's probably, a, a, it's okay. It's going to be called Historic Red Hook. Okay. Thank and you. It's not to be confused with HRH, which is probably an acronym you've heard before. <laughs> yes, I do mm -hmm. believe we have. We Historic Red Hook. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And we will be housed in our largest single artifact, now that we can own it, <laughs> the Brennan Benson Historical Society and Friends of Elmendorf will have the Elmendorf. That's great. And so... That's great.
Thank, Thank you, Chris. You're that's, that's, that's great. I'm glad that vote went through, and it okay. leads the way for it consolidations. Was so it was unanimous. Yes, on both boards, on both, both memberships. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. Um, that, that kind of is a segue for me because I've been meaning to bring this to the board and, and discuss it with you as a something for you to think about. I've talked to a couple of you about it before. I think that that, that, and that um, beautiful indicia or representation of the bicentennial might be a great welcome to Red Hook um, sign. And I'm going to have to look into it to see how much of it could be incorporated. Signage is usually difficult to incorporate that many elements in terms of the, the um, intricacy of, of that particular um, lo uh, logo. However, I think if, if we were to have welcoming to Red Hook, there is nothing better if you all will think about it, and we can talk about it again, there would be nothing better than that bicentennial <coughs> logo. I've talked with Claudine. I believe she designed it. Is that correct? I think it was a group effort, and she had a hand. Right. right, and she said, what better use for the logo for the bicentennial? I was thinking if we just said, um, welcome to bicentennial Red Hook, or welcome to Red Hook 1812, 2012 would be enough of a message and incorporate some of what's there. Maybe not all four colors, but some of it. So I'd like to um, have the board think about um, approving that I go to Color Page, who has the artwork, and get some um, renderings. They have, they have all the artwork and come back to you with some suggestions for nice signage because Red Hook needs it and deserves it, and we haven't had any in quite a while, and I just think that would be stunning if we could, if we could work it out for all four corners of Red Hook. Welcome to Red Hook. Yeah. Okay, that's all I've got. You don't have anything? No, not today. Positive, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're gonna move right on if there's no more public comment with someone we've been waiting for and he's at, with bated breath. No, it's it's um, the policy of the town board to hear from the water department director at least in the first quarter or half year about the status of the water department and water district one. And Hank and Perry's is here tonight to lead the discussion. Thank you, Hank, for coming. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I think what I'll try to do. That's that's fine. You you put it wherever. Pull it, back here pull it wherever you're most comfortable, and Hank. We have a few extra copies of the presentation if anyone needs them. Thank you. Put them here. I don't know why I want it. Okay. So this is about what happened in 2012. Um, Start off with the organization and the highlights of 2012, our plans and goals for 2013. Same agenda as every year. Water quality, future considerations, and then the financial overview. So, yeah, that's it. If you want me to go on, I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't want to cut you off when you've just started. <laughs> All right, the organization hasn't changed. The water board, uh, I don't know when the last new member came on, several years ago. And uh, so essentially we're a long-term group. And uh, we don't meet often. There really isn't much business anymore. When I came on the board, we were busy establishing the district and building the tank and, you know, doing things that needed doing in the early uh, history of the district. Now there just isn't much. So we meet, uh, we plan to meet every two months, and those are basically status meetings, except if we have, there are occasionally um, meaningful meetings when uh, we have to discuss a bit, like for the operators, or uh, uh, cleaning the tank, or painting the tank, that kind of thing, inspecting the tank. So basically it's every two months, and uh, I don't insist, I don't think it's important that everyone come to every meeting. They come when it's important, and that's good. 
it would probably be boring and a waste of their time to come too often. Operations personnel um, was United Water uh, doing the operations. Um, at the end of 2011, uh, we switched over to BRI, United Water got out of the business of operating small systems, and BRI Environmental out of Millbrook took it over. Um, we've had a pretty constant uh, operations management with them, and we've been very happy with them until earlier this year. Things just weren't getting done promptly or well. And we were going to mention it at the, uh, we have a, a monthly work session with the operators. We were going to mention it to the operator, and uh, we had heard and he came in with a replacement operator. He'd just been overburdened and not able to keep up. So the, our new operator is a guy named Alan Geppel, who was with United Water. A lot of experience, seems to be a good guy. So I'm looking forward to working with him. Uh, as far as administration, it's Carol Little who does the administrative work and me who comes in and occasionally advises her. Building operations are Carol Little, meter readers, Cynthia Files, John Wittenberg, and Chris Gifford. Chris came on, I think, last year. And revenue collection is Ms. McCann. We have fun. Chasing down delinquents. <laughs> <laughs> if she can't handle them, she hurts <laughs> Hank, would you tell me again the name of the person that represents VRI? Alan? Alan Gittel. I'm sorry, I mispronounced it. G O E T T W E or E L. I'm not sure which. Okay, got yes. it. He says, it sounds like Guru. Or another one of those guys. Okay, so. Uh, 2012 highlights, what did we do? Not a lot. We had treats, uh, <laughs> treats, not really. I mean, our, our business uh, repair, that kind of thing was minimal. We did have to clear some trees under the power line going down to the pump house. They were rubbing against the wires and tripping breakers. And uh, that cost us $2,100. Um, another thing that I wanted to do, uh, Hurricane, uh, what's her name? Irene. Irene knocked a lot of trees down in a, a right of way that is important to us called Ghost Road. If you're not familiar with Ghost Road, it runs from First Street in uh, Linden Acres over to Zabriskie Court just off of uh, Kelly Road. So uh, I had to, we had uh, bullfrog tree expert, experts go in and just clean up trees that were down. We didn't try to brush hog or anything like that. That had been a couple, couple two or three years before, but didn't need it. But trees, there were a lot of trees down. So, uh, by the way, Bullfrog used to be Jeans Tree Service. Maybe some of you know that word, name. And that cost us $1,900. So the two operations cost us, what, $4,000. The more interesting uh, saga uh, pertains to the old two-inch main along the south side of uh, Aspenwall, uh, which showed up a few years ago when it leaked. Nobody knew it was, it was there. Perhaps the previous operator, Jim Riley, who was with Annandale, might have known about it, but he never brought it up when we did the maps. So it didn't show up on a map, and it leaked. So uh, Rich King patched it once, then he had to patch it again, and then when United Water took over, they had to patch it again. So we said, let's just get rid of that. It's just going to be problems. The problem is there was one house still connected to it. The house next door to the lot that the town now owns, uh, uh, Aspenwall, that was our water district property. Uh, that house was hooked up to the old main, so we had to connect it to the real main. Well, that wasn't easy. We had the highway come over, the department come over, and we dug on the north side of Aspenwall about three years ago, I think, and dug down and dug out, no, no water main. That's where we thought it was. So then Jerry Gilnack, one of our water board members and uh, our operator, Mark, they did something, they uh, hook up a pulsing kind of thing to a hydrant, okay? So it pulses water through the main, 
And then they listened. And they both said, well, the main is in the middle of the street. Sounds good. So the next time we dug, started, I don't know, started on the north side, dug across four or five feet down all the way, never saw, never found a main. So that was kind of a mystery. Uh, a few months later, we tried again. This time, we started with a curb stop on the north side of Eskimo. Followed that down to the main, and it was eight or ten feet down, so that's why we missed it. So we found it, hooked up that house, and that part got done. Uh, then later on, last year, two or three times, we dug, tried to find that old main and where it's connected into the system. No luck. So we decided that's it. We'll just let it survive until it leaks. When it leaks, we'll find it, and maybe we can, you know, find the connection there. So that's where we are with that. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. A little frustrating. Okay. The other thing, testing. Um, periodic tests. Uh, there's some that are done daily, monthly, and yearly, and then there are a number of special tests that we do every uh, three years, six years, whatever. Um, last year, 2012, we tested special tests for asbestos and lead and copper. Uh, no problem. I guess I have to say, we're just lucky. There isn't anything that we can do proactively to ensure good test results. Not much. I mean, make sure our chlorination works, things like that. But, you know, it's, uh, the water's good. That's all. Okay. Our annual inspection, the health department engineer, gave us a, a good report, but he found a couple of things that needed doing, and certainly we agree. Um, the one at the bottom of the page, uh, the manhole cover over one of the wells as well, too. Doesn't Man, just like a manhole in the street, it provides access to the pump, the motor, whatever. Uh, it wasn't seated properly, uh, resting on a vent pipe, so we just had to put a little riser on the edge of the manhole. And so it's now seated properly. The other thing, the pipes in the filter room, uh, a number of them need painting. Uh, some of them are quite rusty. And, uh, Rather than just paint, uh, the main pipe going from the filters and out into the ground and up the main is very rusty. It's been tapped a number of times for or an injection, this or that, and patched, and it's been leaking, and it looks bad, really bad. Uh, it goes across the end of the house about, say, four feet high, it goes down into the floor, and then out to the main. Well, the pipe going down into the floor was it's just covered with rust. So we were afraid we were going to have to replace that. But uh, this new operator, Alan Gettle, was over there and uh, he checked it, scraped it, whatever. It's just, there's a lot of good metal there. But it's good. So all we'll do is remove the rust, replace some of the pipe that's been tapped and patched and so on, and paint everything. A little interesting uh, aspect there. In order to do that work in the pump house, we have to be able to shut the water off going out into the system. And our maps don't show a valve. So we figured there must be a valve there. And I looked at the original contract drawings, and sure enough, there was. So then the guys were looking around and didn't find, they found the valve that goes for the village interconnect. But they couldn't find the, the main valve until Gettle was there day or two, he found it. So, we're all set there. Right. Okay. So far, none of that has cost us much money. And by avoiding the, the necessity for going down through the floor, putting in a new pipe, uh, we're saving some money, at least for a few years. Uh, we figured that uh, we may be able to combine that work with some other work that, you know, We'll probably have to do one of these days. <coughs> okay, looking ahead, we'll just continue to do the same old stuff, uh, monitoring quality and operations, meet monthly with the operators, uh, conduct all the tests. We do special tests this year for inorganic chemicals, principal organic chemicals.
SOCs. There's another category called SOC secondary, sometimes called synthetic organic. But anyway, those are the ones for this year. Oh, and radiologicals, IOCs, POCs, and radiologicals. That includes radium, uranium, and just checking for general radiation, alpha particles, and beta particles. Uh, current stuff, you finished it up a week or two ago, or a month ago, transfer of that lot and pass them all to the town for this book uh, as a trail. So that got done. Teresa was kind enough to take that over. Take over the, high, the road to the tank. Anyway, water meters. Uh, we're kind of at a loose end. Our current water meters are no longer being uh, manufactured, and uh, so we won't be able to get either meters or the remote registers that sit on the outside of the house. Um, nobody seems to be making replacements. Um, the Dutchess County Water and Wastewater Authority has been in the same situation. They've been looking and they settled on a meter system and they're trying it out in one district at this time. You know, putting it in, making sure that everything works when they try to do the filling and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not uh, totally automatic. The reading is done with a gun and the readings are stored in the gun and then you offload them somehow. So uh, we may just go with that system uh, because we can easily buy a gun. Well, it's $900, but something going to have to have sooner or later anyway. So, and uh, just if we have to read some of those meters with the gun, fine. You know, we're not going to go through a wholesale replacement as the village is doing now. Okay. Filling system. The SCA wanted to replace our current filling system. They have a new product, a new version, and they don't want to maintain two systems. So uh, the cost is going to be $3,900 for the new system and $1,000 a year, as we pay now for maintenance. And uh, this seemed like unreasonable. We don't need it. We don't want it. So I told SCA, send them a note. We don't need it, we don't want it. Why don't you just uh, leave us with the old system and continue to charge us the $1,000? They didn't want to do that, but they're giving us the new system for free, and so it would pay us $1,000 a year. So that worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, like the way you think, Hank. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, it's annoying to have to pay for something that you don't need. <laughs> they need it, we don't. <coughs> okay, future. Uh, nothing immediate. Uh, the storage tank again, but we won't do anything with that until it's inspected again in 2015. And we'll see what we're, where we go from there. Chances are it would be good for another. Chances are it should be painted, but even without painting, it's probably good for another 10 years or so. At least. Yeah. You went over that letter from the mayor of the village of Redhook. Oh, I skipped that. That's of interest to us, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, Unless you don't want to talk about no, it. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, they're doing a lot of work to search out, you know, to uh, expand their uh, supply of water, looking at the old wells out on 199, etc. I just thought that they might want to consider hooking into us. It's not a freebie, you know, there's installation and uh, some pumps on our end or a pump, whatever. The thing is, uh, in 2010, I think it was, or 11, we supplied Bard College totally for about three months. We intended, the original intent was to provide Bard with water over the summertime, but, you know, schedules slipped. So it wound up, uh, the students came back, and we didn't switch over until end of October. So our normal output is under 100,000 gallons a day. We were pumping close to 300, 260, 70. And we did that with one pump, pumping less than 24 hours a day. So I thought, gee, you know, although we don't have permission from the health department, I think it should be available. So we could easily provide the village with 
probably all the water they need, you know, to supplement their own supply. So I sent them a letter, sent Rondell a letter. I haven't heard. Just for your information, we don't need that business, okay? We're doing fine as we are. I might talk about another rate increase, a small one. But anyway, you know, we're still um, doing fine. And providing somebody with additional water will, yes, bring in some more revenue, but it also increases the wear and tear on the pumps and the business. So it isn't something that we would be searching for. We're trying to be a good neighbor, that's all. And how long ago was that letter sent? Do you December. Recall? In December? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Haven't heard. A couple of the guys from the village stopped in, I forget their names now. They seemed to think it was a good idea. You know, they're worker type guys. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, sounds reasonable to me, you know, because it's outstanding water. You don't have to treat it for iron. You don't have to worry about a lot of things. It would be a very, very dependable supply. And Did I hear you say that there's a valve uh, there that connects yes. in that? Yeah, we already have a main going up. Um, what's the brook? Road, Willowbrook, Road. Willowbrook Road. And it connects to the village on Willowbrook Road, but that comes in on North uh, Broadway. Mm -hmm. It um, really isn't a big enough main mm -hmm. to be useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's really not a functional connection at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Except in the other direction, they, mm -hmm. could, they could give us some water. Mm -hmm. oh, the other problem is we would have to put a pump in the line in order to provide them with water. Mm -hmm. No big deal, but we would have to do that. Certainly a resource that is could be utilized utilized um, they very have, favorably. Yeah, they have pumps down called variable frequency drive, where the volume of the pumping is uh, controlled by a frequency fed to the motor, and that's uh, automatically controlled by pressure sensitivity. So the nice thing is, if the pressure goes down somewhere, whether in our system or theirs, um, the pump just pumps faster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a nice situation. You don't have to have uh, fancy controls to turn it on and off. Mm -hmm. So anyway, <laughs> we're here. Okay, financial, operating expenses. We were fairly low again this year and last year, 77K last year, 79K this year. But as I say, they're two easy years. We haven't had any major expenses. Um, then we'll go to revenue. And we're in good shape, yeah. Our revenue, uh, oh no, where am I? I'm on the wrong page. I think it's okay. very it is. Yeah. Nope, that's not it. It's here. All right. Uh, revenue. Uh, 109K this year, 104K last year. So essentially the delta between expense and uh, revenue, well, about 30K, mm -hmm. which isn't bad. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's nice as long as you don't have expenses. Uh, you can easily spend a lot of money, you know, running a water system. So, uh, what we're thinking about is maybe doing another 10% uh, increase in the rate, just to give us a little buffer. Even if we could put 20,000 a year into our uh, reserves, 10 years, it's only $200,000. Um, if we do something with the tank, it's going to cost us about a million or more, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, we'll probably come back to you this fall and suggest another 10%, mm -hmm. which would still leave us far below mm -hmm. in terms of uh, water rates, far below either the villages here or the village of Rhinebeck. Right. So. Okay, good. Okay. And then our reserve status. Um, <laughs> interestingly, Tuesday morning I was looking at this and I said, hmm. Those totals don't add up. They're not correct. 
You know, it's one of those things that got mistyped one time, and nobody ever caught it, so we had to redo those. Um, so our total reserves are now uh, 200 and, or 676,000, but in a sense, it's really 600,000 because I, talking with Debbie, trying to understand this. The unreserved balance is not really a reserve. Mm -hmm. That's basically a bucket mm -hmm. into which your revenue goes and your expenses come. So at any one time, it might look big or small. So <coughs> while it's listed as a reserve, you really can't count it as available money. So we uh, transferred 40000 last year from uh, unreserved to the transmission reserve. 2011, we had a big transfer that was as a result of the large uh, amount of revenue from Bard College. But I can't anticipate continuing to do that if we have a, uh, let's say, profit uh, revenue versus expenses of 25 or 30K. You're going to have expenses, so I don't know. You can't count on transferring $20,000 a year. Okay, anything else? Yeah, the uh, operations, which is so fascinating. You know how many million gallons here and there. Um, we haven't added a house in six or seven years, so we're still on 484 houses. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the significant number here is our built to pump ratio, uh, the measure of your efficiency, really. How much you're selling versus how much is being wasted or lost. And we're still up at 90 which is uh, better than almost anyone. Because you got out of the you have uh, hydrant flushing, and you have uh, this and that, and a little bit overflow here. You know, so 92% is awesome. We're lucky. So if that got a lot less, then that might force the meter issue? Hank? I'm sorry? If that number uh, was a lot less, then that might force the meter uh, issue? Probably not. It'd probably be a function of leaks. You know, old systems have a lot of leaks, like the Village of Red Oak has a lot of leaks. The Village of Rhineville probably has a lot of leaks. New York City has a ton of leaks. You know, we are not in that situation. We don't have a lot of leaks. So that's, that's the key there. Okay. That thing? Okay. That it? Oh, no. <coughs> yeah, that's it. Well, congratulations for once again entertaining us for 25 minutes with the, the whole year's report. Well, it's, it's always a good report. And Hank, we appreciate your cooperation with the Recreation Department this year. That was really a very happy circumstance that we you were able to work that out. And yeah, that's uh, relatively well, it is, but it's yeah. just... The, the thing that we're looking at now is, uh, Chris, been involved. When we added the current rec park, mm -hmm. started the supply, we didn't put it in the district. It's not in the water district. We also have a house up on Linden Avenue that is not in the district. It's strange. The uh, situation is uh, they were connected to Annandale Water Park but they had their own well, so they were never billed by Annandale, so they really didn't show up, and they didn't get brought into the district. Hmm. A few years ago, the well went bad, as wells do, and he asked if we could turn on, if we could turn on the water, and we do. So we're currently serving him as an out-of-district user. It's 150% of the rate, but the point is our DTC permit does not specifically allow hmm. serving out of district customers. So we're going to try to fix that. And while we're at it, the new rec park should be brought into the district also. Good. Okay? That's great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Hank. That's great. Chair. I think I'll try to um, do a little spade work and, and find out about that letter that went out on, in December um, just because I'm a village resident and I'd kind of like to know. Yeah. If there's a way to to save some uh, water money, it sounds like a practical solution to me because it's so nearby. 
it does to me, but yeah. you know. Okay. Susan, yes. Did I, I, my question was how many users did you have? And the answer is 484. Uh -huh. yep. Okay, thank you very, very much. All right, let's see. The next item on the agenda is related to the purchase of development rights, this time for the Kasiki Farm. And Carrie Watkins Bates of Scenic Hudson is here. And Susan Azrati is here representing the Community Preservation and uh, farmland, protection. farmland Protection Committee. And so um, welcome again. Thank nice you. to have you here. Thank you for coming. May I? I have some materials I don't believe will be distributed. Did I just cut my finger? I see that. Oh. I see that. Oh, see that. Binder. It makes it hard to grab papers. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that would be great if you would use the mic so that we can all hear. Thank you. My name is Carrie Watkins Bates. I'm with Cena Hudson, an environmental nonprofit organization. Uh, many folks in town know us of uh, the work that we've done regarding purchases of rights in farmland protection efforts here in the town of Red Hook. Typically, Art Collins with Dutchess Land Conservancy is, is here with me, but he was unable to attend this evening. Um, and to that end as well, I'm sorry I don't have any uh, large uh, format maps for us tonight. But what I do have in introducing this project to you and what I've distributed to the board is a brief, uh, as you've seen them before, for acquisition costs for a farmland protection uh, project for purchase of the rights on the Kasiki Farm Cattle Incorporated parcel, as well as a set of maps which depict the property um, both individually and in context in the town. So this parcel, some folks may be familiar with it, it's 74 acres owned uh, by Kasiki Farm Cattle Inc., which is owned by Frank Vosberg. It's part of a larger assembly of Vosberg family lands um, on Middle Road and on fronting Rokeby Road. And on the first map that you have in the package which I've distributed to you shows an aerial view of that parcel. It is uh, the, the large parcel of that land, including a small access piece to, I'm sorry, I'll forget, Orchard Road in the development there. Okay. If folks aren't familiar with, um, with Kasiki, Farm. It is an operation which farms in total about 500 acres in the town of Red Hook and a little bit further afield, including the parcel right next door, the 150-acre Kalina Farm, which you may recall was the subject of a 2012 uh, project that we partnered with the town and with the USDA on. And in keeping with that, uh, what we are uh, proposing here is a project similar to those which we've done for the past several years, which would partner Scenic Hudson, potentially Town of Red Hook, and hopefully USDA Farm and Ranch Land Protection Program monies together for the purchase of development rights. That USDA program is a 50% matching program that's funded and authorized out of the Farm Bill. We've been very successful in the last few years in leveraging that funding, as you may recall from our projects on Curly Corners Road, and last year with the Kalina and Greg Farm Project, which just most recently closed this spring. That program can provide up to 50% of acquisition funds, and as we've done in the past, we'd be looking to match the, or make the required 50% match with funding uh, brought together 
so we have it, uh, we have submitted this project to the USDA for funding and we're hopeful that we'll hear a response from them in the upcoming month or two perhaps sooner but realistically uh, I'll, I'll say two months we, we don't control that process and it, and it has varied somewhat um, over the last few years on how long it takes for them to uh, get back to us on our, on our application request. It's typically a once per year application round. This year actually may be a bit different with another round. The deadline was when? I'm sorry. The deadline for, the deadline for submission to the USDA program was April 30th of this year. And that's typical. It's usually a spring application date. This year is going to be a bit different for the USDA. Um, while their initial, what they call ranking period, announced uh, due dates with a final due date on April 30th, we have heard from staff at the New York level of the agency that there may be an additional round of funding coming up later this, uh, later this summer, uh, late spring, early summer, uncertain. Uh, but the, the, tr the kind of traditional ranking period has come, and we have submitted this project. And in context, it was one of eight that Scenic Hudson partnered with the Dutchess Land Conservancy in Dutchess County and with Columbia Land Conservancy in Columbia County uh, of those projects that we put together. So only, um, it's a little flip-flop from a few years ago where we had many projects in the town of Red Hook and a few in Columbia County. This year we have, in this most recent round, we had one project in Dutchess County here in the town of Red Hook and the remainder were in Columbia County. But it is part of a larger suite of projects that we have submitted to that uh, to that funding source. And we're very hopeful um, and, and optimistic that that funding will be awarded. So uh, what you have shows some detail about the project, including an estimate on cost. Uh, it is an estimate because we do not have a, an exact number of acres based on the survey, which we typically have, uh, I think, in the past when we've come to you. Uh, we have not yet done that work for uh, pending pending funding from the USDA. But we assume, based on tax records and other survey, nearby survey work, that the parcel is approximately 74 acres, and that the purchase price based on appraisal would be $5,800 per acre. And what you can see based on the um, page that I've given you is an estimate there for total cost of the acquisition, it is well on the bottom line uh, estimated project costs, and that's similar to the way that that's been presented to the board in the past. You may recall that the USDA program, while providing 50% match for the acquisition costs, does not provide any match for these project-related costs. And so as we've done in the past, we would request that uh, the town consider funding 25% uh, of the acquisition costs, but 50% of the project-related costs and that being matched by, um, as has been in the past, by the Duchess of Conservancy and those costs. And that gives a total project uh, cost, as you see in the box there, of approximately $472,000, with a request approximately of $127,000. Now that number includes a 5% contingency because we do not have the survey yet. As is typical with all of our projects, purchases are based on a per acre price is determined by the appraisal and simply uh, multiplied out by the number of acres that, uh, that are surveyed. And so that may be more or less, but we've uh, all allocated for a bit more in the case that that would happen. And that's uh, in line with the way that the project was presented to the USDA um, as well as to the Scenic Cutson uh, Land Trust Board of Directors. So that's very detailed, but I skipped over a bit, and I want to go back to a general about the, about the parcel. So as I've noted, um, Kasiki Farm operates about 500 acres uh, in and around Red Hook, the closest of which is right next door at the Kalina Farm on Ropey Road. As you can see in the maps that I uh, provided you with, um, it is mostly uh, wide open with approximately 26 acres of cropland, 31 acres of pasture, and importantly for many of the projects that we've done, it has 46 acres of what are uh, USDA designated uh, soils or farmland of statewide importance, that's 62% uh, of the property. And in looking at it in line with the town's community preservation 
Community Preservation Project Plan. It is a third tier ranked project. And uh, Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it actually gets bumped up to being a second tier because it is adjacent to the Kalina Farm, which was a second tier project. Um, it also is um, designated as a gateway in the Community Preservation Project Plan uh, parcel as well. Those resources are shown on the maps that I've distributed, um, including what would be proposed uh, for resource protection area, the soils, and a table that, that outlines those. There's a map, uh, which is titled Map 5B, which shows the parcel in relation to other protected lands, including farmland and parkland in the town of Red Hook. And I apologize, it seems, oh, I'll go back to the beginning. I had to do because I had to be in that. So uh, that is the project in general, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have about it. And we would be uh, most pleased if it was something that the board would consider. I missed what you said when you were describing 26 acres in crops and then 30 acres of some, 30 some acres in something else. What Pasture was land. Pasture. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask you the, the status of the rest of the Kaseki farm? Uh, we went through that over the years. <clears throat> Aren't there conservation easements on the other side of the, of, uh, of the road there? My understanding of the remainder of the lands owned by the Vogsberg family are, are varied. They are owned by multiple and different members of right. the family. Uh, most nearby, as part of a whole farm plan and of uh, what I understand to be the kind of original big subdivision of the land, mm -hmm. included a um, mm -hmm. conservation easement on that is held by the Winnicky Land Trust, and it is, I believe, a term conservation easement on the lands which are just to the east, and so mm -hmm. you can see on the map here, on this parcel here. There are not conservation easements on any other portion of that land. Of those lands owned by by the Bosford family along the old road. So that's a piece of land. It's, know actually, that, um, it's actually on the west side of Middle Road. It's on the, it's on the west side of Middle Road. Yes, okay. between Middle Road and this parcel. Yes. Okay. This parcel um, does not actually access Middle. It does not have access to Middle Road, mm -hmm. although that is the, the entrance to the farm. You know, if, if you're yeah. familiar with it visually, that is the entrance to the farm market. Mm -hmm. I can see Middle Road here. Um. Well, on your map uh, 5B, though, you can see the farmlands that they're, they're using right now, you know, on the east of the proposed um, parcel. But, uh, yes, those are owned by other members of the Vosper family who have not um, indicated any interest in farmland preservation for, for the conservation who, 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 who has those easements, though? The, uh, not Dutchess Land Conservancy? Winnicky, is that? Yeah. Winnicky Land Trust holds an easement on a, a small portion. I believe it's, I, I don't want to guess because I'm not certain. Uh, it's the lands that are between <coughs> here. This is Middle Road. Between Middle Road and this parcel. It's, it's essentially the, the front field that fronts <laughs> Middle Road. Yeah. And the access, the access of this parcel uh, from Middle Road is really on a farm road, from Ro Rokeby Road. From, from, from Middle Road is a farm lane coming yeah. in, and the legal access on the parcel is Rokeby Road here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is Orchard Lane. I'm sorry, I don't know. Like, I, I think that's, that. that's fair. It's the last of the of the lanes in the community right. development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I figured all out here. Okay. So, um, just to clarify, you have submitted. We have the application, the application in for time for that deadline. We have to the okay. USDA, and I believe that we are imminently near to mm -hmm. finding out the result of that application. Mm -hmm. I would assume mm -hmm. we've been with them up with you. And does that application assume the participation of the town of Red Hook? It, it has. Okay. Okay. As you uh, you may recall, as we've done in, in previous in previous rounds, I think all. The two previous rounds that we submitted projects in the town of Redwood, 
the Scenic Hudson uh, Land Trust Board has, because it's required of the USD application to have that 50% match, has indicated um, that has indicated a match component from Scenic Hudson of that amount, but it has been the understanding of our board that we would have the participation of the town of Red Hook. Okay, so so if, then, if something should happen that the town of Red Hook did not participate, Cena cuts and would pick up fifty percent. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. That okay. would be a decision of our board. Okay, so you're submitting up with the um, understanding. With the expectation, or right? Okay. That the town okay. Would All right. What do we need to do tonight? What is it that we're looking to accomplish tonight? Put it on an agenda at some point. I. Um, yes, if it would be an action that the town would consider to move forward um, for the public hearing, I mean, and provide you with any materials that you would need if you would need the secret form for that. Okay. Yeah, we don't. We would just need the secret form, and then I think we could schedule a date for the public hearing. Um, if we wanted to uh, anticipate that being done on the June 1st? It, uh, June, what, 11th, June 11th, I think it is, yeah. Right? Yeah, I think um, that's right. Potentially we could schedule the public for the end of the month, mm -hmm. of June, but I think we might have to anticipate that a little bit in terms of notices. I'm not sure we have time. Well, June 11th to June 26th is right, pretty so tight. We have quite enough time for the notice, right? Mm -hmm. If we did our final approval in July meeting, that would work for you. So why don't we make that plan and we'll have papers ready for your June meeting, and then we can schedule the hearing for the first meeting in July. Okay. Would that work? That would be wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so we'll prepare a seeker and a resolution for the board, and then there's a waiting period, and then right, we'll... Period. Have the public hearing with 10 days or 15 days. I've forgotten what the timing is, but it's likely it'll be the first meeting in July. Okay. Okay, and the date of that. Would be. Right. So tentatively, we're we'll just. I just want to pencil it in so I don't lose it. Okay. Susan, um, could we have uh, Susan to report at this point about the committee's look at Kasuki? Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thanks very much. Shorter. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have, I believe, uh, a three pager which includes some of the materials that Carrie gave you about the acquisition costs. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also have a memorandum from the Community Preservation Fund and the Farmland Protection Committee. Uh, we convened on March 19th uh, with actually most of this same information before us to review, to review the application from the Kaseki Cattle Farm. At that meeting, um, we also reviewed other applications before us or that had come to us. One of them was... Uh, from the Stagius property. Stages. Um, stages. Yes. But but um, learned at that time that that property, which is four different properties, um, would, the owner did not intend to combine it and wanted a parcel, wanted a residence on each parcel, which is existing, so we had to seem to qualify for mm -hmm. uh, the funding. Um, there were five members at that meeting, Pete Hubble, Brent Kovalchik, Ken McGutterelli, Richard Brzezinski, and myself. Um, so the two other members, John Hardiman and uh, Marianne Johnson, could not be there, but they did receive the same information. Um, along with the committee, we had Carrie Watkins Space and Art Collins to discuss the project with us. We reviewed their materials and um, excerpts from the application from Scenic Hudson and Dutchess Land Conservancy. You don't have the full report before you, but much of it is similar to the report that we had for the cleanup farm, in which it was discussed the quality of the soils, where 
um, what farm records they were able to uh, provide foods to, etc. Those are important, I think, for the USDA application because it's the idea that um, they're producing for local markets um, and um, advancing that that uh, positive farming culture. Um, Anyway, we reviewed that criteria and the committee voted unanimously to recommend that the town board fund this application. Um, the committee believed that the property represents unique preservation opportunities. The Kaseki cattle farm is an actively farmed parcel of 74 acres, much of which is of statewide significance. It is being farmed in conjunction with the Kalina farm that was protected through the program um, in this past April. Um, in addition, it sits on zone one and two aquifer recharge zones, is part of the Sawmill River watershed, and includes valuable forest zones. As a contiguous farm to the Kalina farm, the Kaseki farm is ranked as a rank two parcel by the Community Preservation Fund project program, um, and it also is along a road that offers one of the more memorable scenic views um, in the village of Red Hook. Uh, it's a key gateway parcel, and as a consequence, its asset, its uh, protection will be an asset to the village of Red Hook as well as the town. Okay, are there any questions uh, of Susan by this board? Well, I guess the same question I have, and I'll bring it up again with Carrie. <clears throat> if I understand it correctly, the, the original farm, you know, the second farm, was a target of many people's um, you know, uh, interest about what would ever happen with this beautiful farmland. And um, I think that the uh, owners of the farm, you know, devised it to their children early on, so it was only, as you say, it was cut up to the children. But there were discussions way back then about preserving the farmland. I think that the town um, was not necessarily, we didn't understand that they, anybody was interested that much in preserving the farm, that that would be something perhaps would come up in the future. So it looks like we've reached that point now. Um, <clears throat> my question would be, uh, I mean, again, I'm sure nobody could impose, you know, the criteria that you've applied and the logic that you've applied to the uh, preservation. But I think um, <clears throat> it would just be to try to frame a question. In your examination as a farmland protection, you know, committee and, and the city Hudson, I mean, are you satisfied that what is proposed here for the town to invest in? and preserve is consistent with what has already been set aside by individual members of the Kaseki family, you know, and adjacent parcels, where they're actually, some are farming it, and uh, they had a, uh, some kind of an event, you know, during the summer, a music uh, festival or something. Um, uh, or, or do you need to have a, a sense that it's consistent with what you were proposing? Do you understand my question? I'm not sure. I okay. think I think uh, the committee is in a position where it can only apply, only look at the parcel that's presented to it, so that we didn't consider other parts of the family's domain. Okay. So we were looking only at that parcel, and on the basis of that parcel's particular attributes, deemed it to be uh, a good. Well, I, I just I remember there was language about the future of those properties and what the family intended to do with it. And I'm just not sure, you know, whether that's uh, protected by whether whatever Winnicky has there or any other documents that have been. Uh, I, I'm not familiar preserved. with Winnicky. Okay. So we reviewed, uh, particularly in our work with the appraiser, we reviewed the 2007 subdivision. That because that did have a what, a whole farm or a, a farm plan right. filed with it, and that was prior to the new the new zoning, the new mm -hmm. ABD zoning. Um, just to reiterate what I so that it's clear, you know, 
we have not had any other discussions with other members of that family who own other portions of what had been subdivided in 2007. Mm -hmm. Frank Vosberg, Mr. Vosberg, is, is the only one who has applied to the town. He's the only one who has um, come to either Sina Hudson or Dutchess Land Conservancy to discuss permanent protection of his land with a conservation easement. It's my understanding, although I, I, this is just my understanding, and I, I'm not extremely familiar with it, that that parcel that I, uh, between the Kisiki Farm cattle parcel and Middle Road, mm -hmm. which, I'm sorry, is not highlighted on that, on that map as such, is subject to a conservation easement that is uh, term in nature, not permanent, and held by the Winnipe Land Trust. And but it's, it's right along the same field. It's plowed, you know, in your picture. It, it's like a, it's an extension of it. It's an extension, but those are owned by two, two different people. I understand, but it's, yeah. it looks like all one. It's 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 operated yeah. um, by Ms. by Frank Fosberg, but it's owned separately. But that land is owned by his, I believe, his sister. Mm -hmm. um, and those conversations, I understand at that time. Again, I was not senior husband was not part of that conversation. Uh, we're with individuals as the land is owned individually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Carrie, the contiguous Kalina property is uh, north, right? Is north of mm -hmm. this parcel. Mm -hmm. And the how many acres are wet? I see quite a sizable area. Did you say that already? Uh, if I did not, let me tell you. Down, go running down to the middle there, you can uh, see on the map what is wooded mm -hmm. and is what is wet. There's a, a drainage through there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There is uh, 13.5 acres of forested wetland. Is that the blue mm -hmm. cross line, cross hat? That is within okay. the blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, And there is 2.4 acres of non-forested wetland. So all combined, there is just about 16 acres mm -hmm. of wetland. And I'm sorry, Carrie, are there two proposed farmstead conferences? There are two proposed farmstead conferences, as shown on that, uh, on the map that was distributed to you. And that includes the existing uh, the location where the existing uh, farm market building is on the eastern extent. And an effort to not take up much more of that area, an additional uh, location on the eastern extent of the parcel that would be accessed from that Orchard Lane access site. East, east would allow east. for only a single home. The eastern or west? The west side. You west, western. Did I say east? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. And that would be access from Orchard Lane. From Orchard You're not showing the access. Uh, it's, this map does not show the access. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Susan, you had, um, is any other, uh, any of the other parcels of the original Kaseki farm uh, listed, a listed parcel in the, uh, in, in the CPF? And yes, and I'm sorry I didn't bring that map with me, but there are some five-acre parcels who are actually ranked by the CPF, they are. but they would be ranked lower than this one. Yeah. How about how about this parcel, what that Bill has been talking about? It is ranked. It is ranked on, yeah. on the CPF. So. Yeah, I have a very small, I can do that, but this is the parcel. Yeah. It's also a third ranked parcel and would become a second. Well, so it's no, in the same it would be because it's, if this one were protected, it, be, it mm -hmm. becomes two because it it's two. got the cleaner mm -hmm. farm north of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this. The so the mass, it, we the, the mass would constitute, uh, right, I understand. Of the okay. And you're talking about the one that has the term conservation easement? Yes, and there's also a third parcel. And what's the size of that parcel? Do you have it on yeah, your chart? 162, I'm just guessing it looks like about 20 acres. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we have town resources. Potentially for additional pieces of the original 
of the original pond. They're brought to you, yes. Pardon? <laughs> if they're brought to you. If, yes, but mm -hmm. understand that. It's just random, though. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Can I just... Hmm? Did I, did I, were they able to I don't know where my head's going. We'll check it out. We'll find out what we're looking like. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure I understand the question, Bill. It seems to me that whether or not the applicant is related to its next door neighbor has no bearing on whether or not the parcel is of value. It either is or it isn't or objectively a valuable piece of property based on the objective criteria that the committee uses. So well, I, no, I, I don't no. I don't understand the whether they're related to people or they're not or no. But I mean, if we're going to invest in the preservation of a parcel mm -hmm. and there are contiguous parcels in the same farm mm -hmm. that were the subject of well, they're not this. anymore though. That, that's been subdivided, was my understanding. It's but not. The question is: Is any of that subdivided land protected, like like they propose to protect this parcel? Oh, not yet. Not, not, not yet. None of it is. None of it is permanent. And so that's so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to invest any money in a field if right right alongside that field they start putting up big homes. So I don't but, know if that's the but, but when you add the 74 acres to the, it was 150 to clean the thing here right. too large parcels mm -hmm. that are together. Right. Just because they have different names on them mm -hmm. doesn't right. make them right. not... It would be nice to have the additional piece. It would be, but it, we, have no, piece. we have no okay. control over no. that, regardless mm -hmm. of who the neighbor is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would love to have sometimes, but we don't. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the ownership of the property is really immaterial to the objective analysis. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, mean, we looked at, we looked I don't know any other way to look at it. Individually, and, and, and while it is always nice you know, using the curly corners example mm -hmm. as a right. as an ideal situation, we right. had multiple contiguous landowners all interested in preserving their mm -hmm. property. That that really is the exception. And mm -hmm. So we have worked with those who have had a, a willingness to mm -hmm. to explore farm mm -hmm. preservation on a permanent basis on their land. And in this instance, it's, it's just the parcel owned by Frank Bosberg is considering that only. Okay, any other questions? Brenda? No. All right? No. Once again, we are grateful to you for coming. Thank you very much for the preparation and the great maps and for your patience with us. Thank you. And let's cross our fingers and hope one more time we're successful with we're USDA. I Okay, so we will put this on the agenda for the next meeting for a look at the seeker mm -hmm. and establishing a public hearing day if we yep. successfully get through that. Okay. Thank you, Carrie, very much. And once again, thank you, Susan, and everyone involved in that committee. They did great work. Have a good evening. <laughs> Okay, I have a couple of really quick resolutions, if I may. It's, uh, I think, a lot uh, behind tab three. And they're really pro forma. Um, there's been a fair amount of discussion about non-smoking policies in, in Dutchess County parks, and numbers of towns have followed Dutchess County's lead and have created town policies for their public spaces to um, authorize a non-smoking policy within town parks and recreation facilities. And I asked John Kuhn if he would go to the Recreation Commission with a request to consider that. And I think we considered it last year and they said they thought it was not a huge issue and they prefer not to take that stand. But I. I put a little pressure on them, I have to say, <laughs> um, and and only because I um, it, it just becomes more and more apparent to me that 
children watch adults. It doesn't matter whether they're their parents or somebody else's parents and or groundskeepers or whoever it is. And it just feels to me if we're investing in a place where children live and play, we need to set up a standard that's the best possible model for them. And so I said that in writing to John and to the committee or the commission. And I also reminded them if they have not, they should talk with someone who has watched a patient struggle for their last breath and they will then know um, how important it is to take a stand against this if there's a way to do that. And so I guess the pressure brought to bear was enough because they did vote to um, come to us with authorization to adopt the non-smoking policy and you'll see the whereas is to help model non-smoking behavior in children and youth and that smoking is responsible for premature deaths of over 400,000 Americans from lung cancer, heart disease, respiratory illness and other diseases. It's secondhand smoke is responsible for 50,000 deaths among non-smokers each year and tobacco kills more Americans each year than alcohol, cocaine, crack, heroin, homicide, suicide, accidents, fires, and AIDS combined. Whereas 80% of smokers start smoking before the age of 18 and the average initiation age is 12. Whereas every day an estimated 3,500 young people under the age of 18 try their first cigarette and one third of these children will die prematurely from tobacco related illnesses. Therefore, the town of Red Hook, County of Dutchess, State of New York resolves as follows that park areas, including picnic areas, sports areas, playgrounds, parking lots in the town of Red Hook, be designated as tobacco-free zones. Appropriate signage will be posted designated tobacco-free zones. The town clerk shall certify the adoption of the resolution, and this resolution will become effective if you so agree. Um, as of today's date, May 22nd, 2013, and I so move that resolution. Is there a, a second? I'll second that. Um, open for discussion. I, I just wondered, in the, when we discussed that in the past, the Rec Commission was concerned with how that would be enforced. So how, how does that happen? Do we know? Well, I think that other townships and uh, county parks and so on have taken the stand that it's self-enforced, that the signage is effective, that um, I suppose we could have cigarette police if we really wanted to, but usually it's respected. And um, we're hoping that that will be the case here. Um, I don't have an answer for that, and I don't think anybody knows precisely how we can enforce um, if someone comes to town hall, for example, and chooses to stand on the porch and smoke, is there a way for us to prevent it? Probably not. Um, but we hope that our taking that stance will um, model the behavior, at least on premises that we have some control over. Yeah, I'm glad they changed their mind. Um, but it is shy of a law, though, right? Um, Yes, it's a policy, I suppose. I don't know that it's a local it's a law. law. Is that a local law? Sure. What well, constitutes a local law? You would have to adopt it pursuant to a public hearing and, and amend it mm -hmm. um, to make it a local law. You with a fine, with a specific fine. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can adopt park regulations mm -hmm. uh, for your own parks, mm -hmm. um, provided that you put signage up. So, I mean, you can certainly adopt this and we can certainly look at it. I think we were hoping for policy so, more than we were law. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it would ultimately be enforceable if necessary um, under the worst case scenario, be escalated to a police matter. Yeah. Not, not in this form. Further discussion. Yeah, yeah, not in this form, I don't think. Yeah. I don't think we're looking for. Well, I would hope not. Yeah. I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's why the, why the form is a policy rather yeah. than a local law, because it's, you know, I can think of lots of laws that have. People have taken great pleasure in flaunting, even if they didn't want to, just because they don't want to be told how to behave, you know, how their personal behavior should be regulated. So I, I'm satisfied with this. I hope you I think all it's are. a good start. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Bill, any comments? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And the second is just uh, really pro forma. It, um, as you know, the Dutchess County is looking for applications for shared services um, components, and one of them applies to one of our departments. The town of um, Hyde Park will be lead applicant for uh, an application that will bring to uh, townships, themselves and townships that are interested, um, a cooperative application for service for equipment, which is the municity program. And they do, they do not have it. We have it, but we need upgrade. And so I asked Steve Cole to ident uh, identify to me what it is that would be an upgrade, and I would like to just make a motion that we um, authorize uh, the application, us to join the application to Dutchess County Shared Services Grant for a desktop and printer that would amount to a total purchase value of $1,400 should that application to the Dutchess County Grant Program be um, favorably received. And I also would like to say that the Village of Tivoli has joined that because they do not have this program. They will become part of that application, as will the town of Milan, who also are looking to upgrade to the municipality program. So I think it, it makes perfect sense for us to um, throw our ask in the hopper and hope that the entire um, application will be considered as a whole and save money for everybody. So I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Madam um, Supervisor, I want to just pause for a teaching. Sure. Thank you. So um, we do have a piece of equipment that has been on the capital plan for replacement at some point, and um, that is our large loader. And um, Harry has gone to a firm, and I'm going to let Harry re lead the conversation on this because he's far more able to <coughs> convey what the report back is than I am. Okay. Um, I went to a J and B truck equipment company to get a, a, a third-party evaluation of the condition of our loader. The replacement cost of the loader is in the neighborhood of $160,000. Um, the loader we have now is approximately 15 years old. Uh, and um, um, not being, being dangerous and only dangerous in evaluating the longevity of a piece of uh, machinery, I thought I'd get a, a professional's opinion on it. So um, they, they evaluated the, the, the machine by taking samples of the lubricants of all of the major moving elements in the machine, like, like the axles, the transmission, the engine, uh, and, and send them to a laboratory for evaluation. They all tested, uh, they all tested with, uh, well. And there was no indication in any of them that, that uh, we're, we're on the last leg. The, the loader has 5,000 hours, just under 5,000 hours use on its engine. These engines are considered to be, to have a lifetime of at least 10,000 hours. So from an engine point of view, it's, it's uh, still has half its life left. Um, there are a couple of condition issues with the loader, uh, which, which can easily be uh, dealt with. The, uh, the, this, the seat, the operator's seat, I guess is well worn and not in considerable disrepair. It's easily replaceable. There are two fenders on it that have some holes in it. It's used for salt. Holy fenders uh, m may be in, from my, <laughs> from my perspective, maybe a, a feature to celebrate <laughs> rather, rather than even spend to replace them. I'm not sure. But they certainly are replaceable or repairable. Um, and the question comes to mind, 
uh, whether we should spend money now, continue to uh, use this loader uh, as it is for an additional period of time, unknown, I would say. You know, you can, you can make a case, well, it's, the machine still has half its life left if you consider, if you consider the engine. But we don't know that for sure, and I'm not sure we want to we want to run it right to its right to its limit. So in any case, um, the estimate for um, a total uh, repair of the loader in its, in its current state that includes replacing the, the seat, replacing the fenders, um, and replace, replacing all of the fluids in the in the machine, which should be done. The transmission fluid apparently, as tested, is. Uh, a little less viscous than it should be, so that should certainly be replaced. Um, and it'd probably be wise, probably seasonally in any case, to change these fluids. So uh, that, that would fall more, more in, the, in the category of routine maintenance. So I, I would recommend that we ask the highway department to re replace the fluids, follow the recommendations of, the, uh, of um, Pat McKean of JT Trucking, and um, keep the machine in service. We might in the future consider keeping this machine for a long term, and should we get to a place where a different type of loader would be desirable, in a few years that we'd, we'd buy another loader and keep this one as the salt loader, the sacrificial one, to work with the salt. Um, it gives, we have a lot of options, in other words, and one of the options right now is to save a rather substantial cost every replacing the loader in, in this budget year. So I would I would suggest that we keep this loader, um, keep it on, on online for uh, uh, another year at uh, a, a year at a time, reevaluate it annually by doing exactly what we did this year. This evaluation costs roughly under five hundred dollars and I think it's money well spent. Um, and that that's would be my recommendation to the board and to the highway department. Okay, any questions or comments, Bill? I'm going to ask the Teresa. Oh, did Pat indicate what length of time it would take to provide this repair? Um, I no, I think I don't think the machine would be out of service service at all to make to make these kinds of repairs. A seat can be the new valve. Cover gasket. The valve cover gasket probably can go on in an hour or two. Okay. In, 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 I think this is all in shop work that could be done on, on a casual downtime basis while, while, while the machine is, would be normally idle anyway. Changing the transmission fluid would take half an hour, maybe. Um, changing the axle fluid, I happened to be there when he checked the axle fluid on the front axle. It was it was below below the level it should have been should be and and it'd probably be worthwhile to just drain that and, and replace it anyway. But all of these are very short term. They don't have to all be done at once. Even and the fenders, I'm not sure there's a lot of point to even repairing them. You know, it's a kind of a cosmetic thing. I mean, they they could be repaired they could be repaired with a a very simple weld job. It's a flat piece of steel. Uh, on each fender to where, the, where the holes are, or probably a new fender is not very expensive either. So the, the total cost of repair with him doing it is $6,000. Yeah, right. He gives, and, yeah, he gives uh, the estimate. I, I think we can do it all in-house. I would recommend we do it all in-house. No, is no. that what this estimate is for, in-house? No. 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 I'm not sure I know enough about it to recommend that. A tractor seat might cost... Um, I'll put it a thousand dollars. Hmm? <laughs> what? We can't make our own. No, but you can buy a new one. Yes. And you can go to Northern Hydraulics and they have ten pages of my tractor seats. <laughs> well, I, you know, I had discussed this with the board earlier. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to go against their recommendation. Yeah. Um, as you said, it's a 15 year old piece of equipment. Yeah. The blood is good. Who knows what shape the body's in? Mm -hmm. He can't look into the brakes. He can't look into the transmission. Well, he can go by the oils and the fluids and say they show normal yeah. wear, but if there's any mechanical malfunction, you know, that's going to show up when it's under stress. And mm -hmm. I'm happy and comfortable to live with that if you are, 
that's fine by me. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm not going to go against the board's decision. <coughs> and if it's a question of let's wait and see, then let's wait and see. We'll go well, ahead and wait and see. I think I think it's also a function of the, <coughs> of the the best level of maintenance, too, and following following a you know a recommendation of someone who does this for a living. Well, he did say that he could tell that it was well maintained by our yeah. department. Yes. It's just he has a mm -hmm. certain. Um, but there is a. It's, it's he has specific oils that he likes to use yeah. for these machines, mm -hmm. and a lot of that has to do with this recommendation. Mm -hmm. The changing of the oils is to take out some of the oils that we have been using mm -hmm. and put in the oils that he would recommend using. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as far as maintenance, they, they do get regular maintenance. If we'd be willing to that. follow I totally his, agree with you. his recommendation as I've well. I've watched them maintaining it all the time. I kibitz with them while they're maintaining this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> How do you spell that word? <laughs> um, just, just to uh, say that I, I know so little about it. I, as I did, defer to Harry, who knows more than probably the rest of us sitting up here. But I also called uh, Jim Ross, who was not able to be with us tonight, to ask him if he had had a chance to look at this analysis. And he, too, is comfortable in waiting this year and following the recommendations of the, um, the uh, consultant. So um, I am content that we'll, we'll try that and see. Does everyone mm -hmm. agree? Okay. Thank you. Okay, Teresa, we're going we're gonna to roll with it and hope that everything works and hope that we repair everything that doesn't work. And whether it's done, if, if you feel more comfortable letting this person do it, that's fine. It looks like that's what the cost will be if he does. Um, you, well, you, you can just... Can right. can come up with. It's probably okay. going to be a, okay. some sort of a compromise, as I said, to see right. is not something we have. So. Okay. You have to buy a new seat, too. Okay. Would be the one you have to While I have Teresa's attention and she's still here able to sit up and take nourishment, I want to thank you and please once again thank everyone over there who came and cleared out all of the old shrubbery, the overgrownness that's been coming in on this building for some time. They've worked uh, nonstop Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, pulled out all of those immense ewes, moved some shrubbery that needed to be moved to to breathe and grow sufficiently and, and beautifully. And her own horticultural good sense made use of repurposing some of the shrubbery we have out there. And I, I hope everybody takes, takes note that, that um, she has moved some of the, some of the overgrown uh, lilies and things will be moved to another place on this campus that makes sense. Um, we had so much mulch out there that what was happening was the west side of the sidewalk was running water and, and snow down into the sidewalk. So it made a real snow ice hazard for, for people as they walked in. It's all been done, taken care of in three days. And hats off to you and the men who worked. And in addition, they uh, completely washed the building and got that all cleaned up. So we did spring cleaning. And That's you did spring cleaning. And planting the grass so, tomorrow. We were so. able to uh, re, um, replant probably 80% of what was out there in different areas it was on remarkable. the town hall campus. So yeah, it's just great. Um, we like the way it looks. We hope that you do as well. Uh, I had a lot of fun though. doing it. It's going and to be the, the maintenance is going to be reduced. And, yeah. and just so we go on record as saying, there are two beautiful blue spruce on either side of the town hall sign that are going to overtake the town hall sign before we know it. And I wanted to, to say on the record that Harold Fell expressed to me before he died how much he would love to have a beautiful blue spruce in the Abrams Park. So uh, Teresa and I are hoping that the tree committee come Arbor Day next year can move those two. And I'm suggesting now so you all hear it and I don't forget that one of them may be able to be moved to Abraham's Park where it can be enjoyed they by some They need a big open space to grow in. Yeah, they do. And, yeah. and his wife, I know he told me many times his wife was wanting so much to have a blue spruce on that hill that could be seen from their house. So I'm just saying. 
You know what? Uh, they put three in and one has died. So there's a perfect place. Perfect. Perfect. They're big, they big are, trees to they move. They are you. big trees. You're not going to move easily. No, but I thought, Harry, with your trowel, you can <laughs> no, do it. I'm sure. I'm sure you'll manage. <laughs> I should keep them. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> I, think we'll, I think we'll get someone who can help us move them. Okay, and again, thank you, Teresa. It was just great. You had fun with it. I really was very envious. I would have loved to have been out there digging in the dirt, doing, not doing what I share. was doing. <laughs> I watched. Do you have more to discuss with us before we move on to another department? No. Or committee? No. Okay. Okay. Should we move on to Thanks, Chris, Teresa. Chris, yeah, here. Chris, I'm going to call on you next because you're patiently waiting to well, thank you. Well, the Economic the Development the Democracy in Action. By <laughs> <laughs> Economic, Development Economic Development Committee Chair. Economic Development Committee. We are uh, we've been at surveying, and it's still I think on the town website uh, business survey survey of uh, better businesses, uh, which has been voluntary and confidential, and we've had good results, and we have a basic analysis that says. That the key strengths of Red Oak are its small town community feeling, its neighborliness, and uh, some of its concerns for the businesses are uh, parking. Uh, and uh, so we're wrapping all of this up in, uh, in a little report to survey. Because whenever you report a survey, the media, the media love that. So we're going to put a, a good uh, a twist on this thing and prove to people by statistics that Red Hook really is business friendly and we want more business and we're going to support our businesses here. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, it's a work in progress. Um, we're going to be uh, uh, looking at uh, using the business results of the survey analysis as part of a, a, a baseline uh, conversation we can have in the media with businesses and through social media particularly, which I love actually that. Advanced uh, PR background it doesn't include anything much more than a, a chisel and a, and a hand <laughs> stuff and tablet. Which I put the McKinsey Journal years ago. But uh, Laura Pensiero is a member of our committee, and she's uh, been in contact with uh, Mary Kay Verba uh, down at the uh, Duchess of uh, Tourism, and she's got a line on how we can piggyback with the county to help. Uh, do some social media awareness uh, through a consistent approach through Twitter and Facebook and whatever else. And we'll work as well with the local media, especially uh, Chris Munn and his wonderful observer, uh, Dan Budd, who's another member of our committee, as Harry knows. Uh, and I met with Chris a couple of weeks ago, and we suggested uh, that it might be, uh, if he's interested, we would have a, a business column on a regular basis, perhaps once a month, that we can do and produce out of the volunteers who are here in the business community because we have a variety of enormously experienced experts like Dan, for example, himself. He's a real pro at, at media and uh, but at running a business. So Chris is interested in that uh, idea. would be under the uh, Economic Development Committee banner, if you will. We don't know what the title would be yet, but we've asked the committee to come together. We'll be meeting, meeting tomorrow morning as part of our discussion tomorrow morning to, to uh, look at some of the ideas that the committee has had and who wants to step forward and volunteer to be the expert of record for these byline columns that would appear in the Observer. And as well, we would offer the opportunity perhaps to the Northern Duchess News. I've been writing for the Bicentennial for the last couple of years, with, so I know Kate Goldsmith as well, and she's been very helpful and approachable mm -hmm. for Northern Duchess News. So we just want to send this out, but really the, the key will be to have a, a cooperative uh, volunteer uh, PR campaign that would be a subscription by perhaps getting the businesses together and at their request or at, at, at their behest, putting together a pot of money we could spend on social media mm -hmm. on a consistent basis with a tagline that says, you know, perhaps get hooked on Red Hook, or perhaps not that, <laughs> not slogan, but we'll, we'll get a slogan and we'll have a business-friendly approach to the media, an outreach to key targeted audiences. Weekenders, yes, New Yorkers, yes, but all of us, too, mm -hmm. so that we are becoming more aware of the resources that we have for business here in, in the township, and that means from 
to lead to, you know, the down and around and back again. So that we bring the feeling of the bicentennial for, you know, tourism, agritourism, education, community spirit, that's all going to be wrapped into this kind of a consistent approach <coughs> on, a, on a regular basis in the media. So that's what we're planning, and uh, we'll yep. get there. The survey, we got some, somewhere on the order of 30, 30 or so responses. Oh, no, we've had, uh, thanks, Harry, I appreciate that. We've had more than 80 responses. We yeah. have. Okay. Okay. Some business now. Okay. It's been, it's been, you know, we ask how's business, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, what are your major concerns? What are your, some of your ideas for tracking business, for maintaining business? Um, and it's, it's, it's been fairly consistent, very positive. People are doing better. Some people are doing not so well. So that's what we want to try to help. Chris, if there's someone who um, it has has concerns or ideas. Are you the person they contact to get on the agenda of the EDC? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I thought, and that's what I've done. But Please, yeah. yeah, and you make time for someone to come in and talk yes. with you. Okay. We, we meet every every second uh, uh, Thursday and, and fourth Thursday in the month, eight thirty in the Village Hall because it's a central location for everybody. It, it's convenient to the businesses, and uh, we have you know, a great team. As you know, we have. Uh, George Verley and Ken Migliarelli and Laura and Sierra and Dan Budd and Kate Caracasas and uh, Todd Baywright again. Yeah, Todd Baywright and uh, Beth Jones and Harry Colgan. No. <laughs> <laughs> are any of the row. are any of the businesses in Tivoli represented? Uh, no. Specifically, yeah. I just Love just that. curious. That's a great it's, idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've talked to some of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are a couple of them up that's there. What, that's probably the key issue for us is is getting the businesses to do this, cooperate. Yeah. And yeah. Kim Gomez is there with us all the time. She's 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 dynamite. She's dynamite, mm. and she's with us. And mm -hmm. Ed Bundella sits in, and Brent is there all the time. And you know, we try to make this a, a community a gathering spot, and they've been really helpful. Mm -hmm. But we need to get the individual businesses to understand that you know. We're all in this together, so I think that's one of the major challenges we're going to undertake. Well, good. Uh, Chris, some of us have been working uh, with the Climate Smart Community people up in Albany, uh, uh -huh. a consulting firm that actually works for them. Yes. And um, the CAC, I think Sue was in on the beginning, mm -hmm. and Dan Budd, Kim, etc., yeah. worked with them to um, help them help us formulate a uh, green business certification program. Yes. We now have that product, yes. and yes. so would it uh, be appropriate to bring it to the EDC? We're looking for the somebody to raise their hand and say, we'll take it from here. Uh-huh, sure, but not tomorrow morning. Okay. <laughs> I don't have it today. Yes, Brenda, thank you very much. Well, wasn't it. Dan oh, yeah, one of the leaders in that? Yeah, yeah, Dan, and Dan, Dan, Dan's very, very active. It's He's probably very, good very involved Dan in it. Dan would bring yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'd love to do that. I won't be uh, at, at either June meeting because I we're going away to see our granddaughter who just got born. Oh, um, congratulations! My mother's 102nd birthday, so it's our first nice. grandchild, and she's Fabulous. born on May 5th. And uh, as I was telling Bill earlier, we're just is her name Virginia? No, <laughs> her name just is asking. Suniva. <laughs> she's Irish, and she came from Ireland a thousand years ago to Norway, and is considered the goddess of sunlight in Western Norway. Na her name name again was what? Her name is Suniva. Suniva. S U N N I V A, typical Norwegian name, and uh, and she has a hyphenated last name. Terrific. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> Well, so, congratulations. Thank you very much. It'll be one of the best roles you've ever so had. Don't forget to come back from <laughs> Norway now. I'll <laughs> <laughs> be back on the 10th. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you Thanks very much. All right. See you again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have anybody else that we want to slide in first? I think we can whip through. It's, it's 20 after 9, and mm -hmm. I think we can go quickly through these board reports if, unless somebody has something they want to spend some time on. Um, I did want to let you know that uh, be before getting off topic in terms of um, bonding, we were talking about uh, the PDR a few minutes ago, that our uh, bond was uh, settled today 
and we were able to get a rate of 0.89 percent. And it was bid by the um, Green County Commercial Bank. So we are very, very fortunate that we decided for the ban of the bond anticipation note, and it will not impact next year's budget except for the interest, which will be a total of something like $6,100 for Sismbridge and for the, um, uh, I think it was the Greg, uh, Greg and Kalina, Greg and Kalina. So that's where we are, and I think uh, we are very fortunate to have gotten into that market. Thank you, Chris, for your help with that, your huge help. Okay, <laughs> that's all we have. Let's let's turn to. Does anyone have planning board or zoning board reports? That would be in behind tab four, I guess. There's a planning board monthly report. I see it. Do you want to um, do you want to give it, Brenda? It's right here. Sure. Uh, the planning board held two meetings in May. The board granted a special permit to Bard College to restore a documented historic landscape near the Hudson River, and it granted a lot line alteration for a property on Starberry Road. The board also granted subdivision plat approval for a parcel in the original Kasiki Farm per the previously filed farmland protection plan and consistent with the new agricultural business district regulations. The board continued to review applications for a proposed minor subdivision on North Road for expansion of the facilities at Devereaux and for a residential development off Old Farm Road. Lastly, it accepted a certificate of appropriateness application for the modification of a residence in the hamlet of Berrytown. Thank you, Brenda. Um, zoning board, I have that report. Are one of you liaison and has that report? You want me to go ahead? Well, I don't, I don't have it. But I read Why don't you read it, Bill? Are you the liaison? Please do. Well, the ZVA met and uh, they considered a review of an appeal um, and uh, it's continuing. Um, they had uh, discussions on, uh, has to do with fencing uh, to the property owner here in the town and uh, they wanted to put in a fence that was a little bit higher than the four foot uh, minimum required or maximum required allowed um, and so that public hearing um, is going to be scheduled on June 12, 2013 at 7.05 p.m. when the ZBA will meet again. Thank you, Bill. Um, is there a dog animal control officer's uh, report? No. No. I um, talked to her briefly yesterday, and she said Red Hook is wonderful. She said there are some towns that have lots of problems, but Red Hook is doing well. So I thought you'd be glad to hear that, that she's very enthusiastic about serving Red Hook. Uh, the assessor's report came to us this afternoon, and it is the following. The 2013 tentative role has been filed and published on May 1st, 2013 pursuant to New York State Real Property Tax Law. One, we have updated some of the information on the website to help people understand the valuation and grievance processes. I am encouraging property owners who have done the research on their property values to discuss it with the assessor before filing a grievance. Please call the assessor's office for an appointment at 758-4604. Grievance day is Tuesday, May 28th, um, 2013. That's next Tuesday, isn't it? From 4 to 8 p.m. Forms will be available through that date. The assessor's office has met individually with more than 40 taxpayers over the past two months and will continue to do so through the end of the week. Uh, they will continue entering data changes and uploading photos of properties already reviewed. They will continue to identify and map neighborhoods as currently coded in our system. 
This will help as we establish a more meaningful coding system that more closely reflects the property and zoning characteristics of parcels throughout the town. And finally, continue to work on a plan to physically inspect and document each of the 4,327 parcels in the town by 2013. This will allow us to conduct an in-house or office appraisal for the 2014 roll year. This is from Scott Hobson. I know that my staff and I remain committed to continuing fair assess assessment practices and I look forward to continuing to serve the citizens of this great community. And it's signed, Scott Hobson, Assessor. Um, Chris, do you have any report of any magnitude for us that you'd like to? Not as such. I think we covered the, uh, um, the I would just note that we do have the additional. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Probably needs to be referred to the um, crime line protection plan to get further information right. uh, about the project. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Bless you, Bless you. From the close application? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have anything from Debbie tonight. We will have a supervisor's report next time we meet. And same with budget officer, building inspector. We have that report. And I think Jim typically gives this. Does anyone else want to give this? It's I can read it in a hurry if you want to. Great. You can probably read it much faster than I can, Bill. Thank you. But the uh, building inspector has submitted to the town a 10, 12-page report. But the bottom line is um, they had uh, <clears throat> 23 permit reports, you know, prepared by them, the different uh, properties throughout the town. As far as inspections go, they made... Uh, a total of 38 inspection reports uh, throughout the town during this past month. Um, now, there were some complaints received, uh, actually only a couple that were dealt with by the, uh, two of them that were dealt with by the, uh, the building department. And as far as certificate reports, which uh, create a lot of work, there were 21 of them that were uh, dealt with by the building uh, department. As far as the amount of money which um, was received through uh, permit fees, uh, it was about $4,147 uh, in, in uh, fees collected for the, uh, for the past month. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we've had the highway department report. Um, in terms of grant applications, we've, we've quickly touched on um, joining the Hyde Park application for the municipality program that's, that's going into Dutchess County. Um, I wanted to let you all know that I sent a note to both Mayor uh, Crana and uh, Mayor Blundell to let them know that um, we, will, we will be moving forward with making an application with their participation for consolidation of highway analysis and um, I sent a memo to them this afternoon asking them for information that I think will enable us to put together a, a very succinct uh, um, statement as to what we're asking for and that would be uh, funding for um, a, a consultant to look at the data that we've got in hand and we're collecting it as we speak and showing all of us where are the efficiencies and what sense it would make to consolidate the highway department. So they are, are now, ha now have that in hand. I asked them to get the information back to me this week. It's not complicated information and we have only a thousand characters to make the application. So it's going to be a very, very tight uh, application process for anyone who is lead agency. It's a very, very small statement about what it is you want to do, why you want to do it, and who you think should be doing it with you. So we're going to try it, and um, more. stay tuned. By, by the end of uh, the next meeting, we should have 
most of what we need to go into that application. It must be in electronic form in the hands of the planning department of Dutchess County by, I believe it's June 27th, so we don't have a lot more time. I thought it was a thousand words. A thousand, a thousand characters. characters. That's a salutation. I think so. I think, <laughs> I think it's a thousand characters. <laughs> characters, it says here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, it's going to be tight. So, um, that's grants. Uh, we also have a, a, a grant into New York State Department of State for a similar process, and we're hoping that one way or the other we're going to get that. Did you say something about a grant for a sidewalk on the east side? Yes, Maybe and that, that the thank you, That's probably, this is probably the appropriate time to, to mention that. Um, as you all know, we always apply for community development block grant money. We rarely let the opportunity go by, and um, because of other meetings that Brenda and Harry and I have had with many officials from Dutchess County and New York State DOT, we're getting feedback that what we really should be considering is uh, a continuation of the sidewalk that ends here at Town Hall and continue that sidewalk on down to Hannaford. And so um, in lieu of any other application for this year, I hope to um, get your approval and, and enthusiasm for applying for that money um, and it's going to take some doing to to do it in one year. I don't know if there'll be enough money to go all the way, but it may be a two-year project, but many of the towns do those projects that are extensive in a two-year phase. In any event, it, the, the good news is that it is in an area that qualifies for block, the block grant. It's in the income block that's required for it to be considered. So. I think we have a pretty good chance of, of getting that and from officials who know roads and traffic and walkways and bikeways, they all agree that this is a really important stretch to, be, to have covered with a uh, sidewalk on both sides of the road. So I'd like to have us consider that. So that's not due, the, uh, the applications aren't out yet, but they will be shortly. So when they come out, that'll be on the agenda too. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the police department report, I haven't one from the village, but I do have Dutchess County Sheriff's Office, and it is for the entire month of April. They had 97 incidents. Um, there were 51 incidents for the reporting period with t total arrests of 8 and 24 tickets issued, but in addition there were other incidents that they responded to. So the total responses that they had in the town of Red Hook were 97 for the month of April. Purchasing, Harry? Have yes, that I have report? A, a short report here. Um, busy as usual, 22 purchase orders were issued for just under $34,000. Uh, one large one was $20,000 for the highway department, which is so often the case for crack filler and sealer for some of the side notes. This is all under state contract. Great, Harry, thank you. And I think we all agree that we got a pretty good idea of what's going on in the water department. Thank Hank for his report. Um, in terms of committee reports, there are only a few. Uh, Bill, you have one for Intermunicipal Task Force. Uh, yeah, well, we've been meeting uh, weekly and still working on the um, proposed uh, section 143-48 of the zoning law, which is called the development within the scenic corridor overlay district, and uh, particularly a, a table, we, we call it 48-1, which is the scenic features of designated scenic corridors. It's really a table that lists the roads and the criteria that are applied, <coughs> the recommendations for designated um, scenic corridors, which has work really been done by the Conservation Advisory Committee, the CAC in the town of Red Hook, for years. I mean, I say since 2006, but maybe even before that. Yeah, I think it was. How far back? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Bill, but quite a long <laughs> but time. But it's been a work in progress for so long, and uh, we've been you know, reviewing memorandums that, uh, that the attorney for the town has, has been preparing for months, for years, frankly. Um, 
to assess uh, you know, some of the legal aspects or some of the concerns about any proposed zoning changes. So that's an ongoing project. We're still working on it, waiting for grants to, uh, to fund it uh, into the next year. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Conservation Advisory Council. Brenda, do you have a mm -hmm. pretty short one? Um, the DEC camp, environmental camps awarded by the VF, the camp scholarships awarded by the VFW and um, administered by the CAC went to Hanlon Crane and uh, Helena O'Shea. Uh, the Ruth O.J. scholarship was also awarded, and there's no name. Do we know who? Maybe it's a surprise. They say. Um, it will be given out June 6th at the awards night at the high school. They uh, received 20 donations for 20 compost bins at the Arbor Day Earth Day Cleanup Day event. Uh, they had a 10% challenge scavenger hunt on Apple Blossom Day, submitted comments on scenic roads. They attended the Complete Streets training, and they meet next on June 5th. Thank you. Great stuff. Okay. Are there more compost bins? They're gone. Sold out. Donated out. Donated out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's all out. <laughs> That's great. That didn't last long. Good work. Mm -hmm. Our purchasing agent will be so happy. Yes, he will. <laughs> yes, he will. Let's not on the agenda. Too much shares. Well, I think we're, you're going to ask for rain barrels next. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, where are we? Rec Commission. Harry, do you want to... Rec Commission has just gone through their busiest period, yes. getting the rec park ready for uh, the, the summer. So they were very busy in the, in the spring doing that. John, uh, uh, the, the Rec Com Commission... Uh, chief uh, finished the brochure for summer activities yesterday. Came back, home, came back from the printer. They are now available. They're online. If the people out there want to know the, the dates and and the schedule for the summer, go on, go online uh, on the town website. And you'll you will find it. Uh, plus, there'll be copies here in town hall. Hard copies. Do you know sign up day? I don't. It's the first two Saturdays in June. Okay. Thank you. First two Saturdays in June. Harry, could I ask you to um, remind John that we have a sandwich board that we could put out front in oh, yeah. town hall yeah, that we haven't used before, mm -hmm. that these programs are <coughs> free. I think many, many people buy, drive yeah, by here, and many idea. people hear about yeah. summer programs but don't realize these are free programs for children supported by the town your taxpayers and my dollars, and, and we haven't, I think, done an adequate job of making sure that weeks in advance of that, that we have that um, signage up out front that it's free. So um, if he needs help, Linda can get to the sign shop and get the letters he needs mm -hmm, for yeah. it for sign up, but, yeah, I think, but I think the free is the big thing, mm -hmm. that, that I'm not sure everybody understands it's free. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, anything from St. Margaret's committee? I don't have anything. They were busy on Arbor Day and had big events. Senior Services Committee reminds us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just to, re I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, just wanted us to uh, remind everybody about the food drive on June 11th and also they have a resignation from a wonderful volunteer Nancy Finkel who decided she couldn't be at two places at once on Thursday and I know uh, I've only been liaison for over a little over a year but she's been a great member so thank you to Nancy oh, thank you to Nancy is right she's a very active person so we have a vacancy we do. Okay, that's important to note. Thank you, Brenda. Um, trails Committee, is there any? Do you want to review anything about the Trails Committee, Brenda? 
Um, I attended their last meeting and they were mostly preparing for the tour to Red Hook, which unfortunately had to be canceled because of the weather. And they are uh, hopeful uh, that they'll be able to apply for some, participate in some grant application. Um, stay tuned. Okay. For, for trail work. Okay. And that's, I think, unless someone else has a committee report, that may be all we have. Anyone? Um, any public comment? Doesn't look like it. Anyone here want to comment? No further comment. <laughs> now, that, now that the public has left, we are free to <coughs> receive a motion. I make a motion. We adjourn. I second that. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you all very much for your time. No, uh, Thank you. Executive session. No.